This is a video about going to space. Specifically, I want to talk about how to get to space. You see, it seems like space travel is enjoying something of an upsurge at the moment. After decades of government agencies like NASA doing not much expensively, we're seeing newcomers like SpaceX and Blue Origin building rockets and suddenly we seem to be making amazing progress towards that future of space exploration we all dreamed of. So forget the space shuttle, this is what the future of access to space looks like. Reusable rocket ships flying on reusable boosters. I don't think so. I think that a fair few of you who are watching this video are young enough that you will get to visit space, to work, to explore, maybe even for a holiday. When you do, the vehicle that you fly in won't look like this. It will look like this. I believe that the routine access to space of the near future will be the age of the space plane. And in this video, I'm going to explain why. To understand the best way of getting to space, I think it helps to understand the problem we're trying to solve. Getting to space is difficult, but perhaps not in the way that you might expect. Space might seem a long way away, but it's actually nearer than you think. The official boundary of space is at an altitude of 100 kilometers above sea level. This line is named after Theodore von Kármán, who once said that this is the physical boundary where aeronautics stops and astronautics begins. 100 kilometers isn't far. I remember thinking during my time at university in Southampton, on the south coast of the UK, that I was nearer to space than I was to London. Whilst 100 kilometers is about three times higher than you can get in a fixed-wing aircraft or balloon, primitive rockets have been able to cross the Kármán line since the Second World War and the first German V2 missiles. The problem with these simple rockets isn't that they can't get to space, it's that they can't stay there. Even if you can get yourself to space, gravity will soon pull you straight back to Earth. If you want to stay in space, the man with the answer is Sir Isaac Newton. Newton's cannon is a thought experiment in which he suggested that if you take a cannon up a high mountain and fire cannonballs horizontally with increasing velocity, they would take longer and longer to reach the ground. This is because of the curvature of the Earth. Eventually you will launch a cannonball with enough speed that, in the absence of air resistance, it will fly full circle around the Earth and return to where it started. The lesson here is that access to space is not a question of height, it's a question of achieving orbital velocity. Newton gives us the tools to calculate just how fast this is. To appreciate the scale of orbital speeds, I find a bit of real-world context helps. The fastest vehicle that the average person is likely to get close to is something like an intercity train. These will routinely run at about 125 miles per hour. That's Mach 0.19, or just under a fifth of the speed of sound. Suffice to say, if you're stood by the trackside when one of these things comes past, you notice it. Ground vehicles like trains, however, are nowhere near as fast as jet aircraft. Most modern jet airliners operate at just below the speed of sound, so Mach 0.88 in this case. A speed that will get you across the Atlantic Ocean in under six hours. Of course, the airline to beat in terms of speed was Concorde, which could operate at just over Mach 2, twice the speed of sound. This was an aircraft with a cruising speed faster than a rifle bullet. We're still a long way from space travel, however, so next let's consider the so-called Spaceship One. Realistically speaking, this was actually just a small suborbital rocket plane. It was capable of popping up above the Kármán line for a few tens of seconds. And in order to do so, it could achieve a speed of nearly double that of Concorde in a vertical climb, which is not to be sniffed at. None of these vehicles have yet come close to orbital speed, however, and to even get close we need to start considering a real space rocket. This is the top speed of the first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket. That is, this is the speed at which the first stage, which is the lower half of the rocket, separates from the top half before returning to Earth. Obviously this isn't orbital speed, in fact, this is merely the launch point for the second stage of the rocket. It's the second stage that has to accelerate the payload the rest of the way. Now ask yourself this, what proportion of orbital speed has the first stage reached? Is it half? Is it a tenth? Place your bets. The answer is that at four and a half thousand miles per hour, or just short of Mach 7, the vehicle is only about a quarter of the way to orbital speed, 
In order to achieve orbit, a vehicle must accelerate to 17,500 miles per hour, or the equivalent of 26 times the speed of sound, and in doing so overcome gravity and atmospheric drag. When you account for all of that, the total delta V, or change in velocity required, is 8.5 kilometers per second from a standing start. This is a big ask. One of the fundamental laws of physics is that linear momentum is conserved. This means that if you want to move forward, you have to throw something else in the opposite direction. Aircraft can use the air around them, but as there is no air in space, the only way to reach orbital speed is to use a rocket. To understand rockets and their limitations, we can use the rocket equation. We can start with the exchange of momentum between the rocket and its exhaust, and use that to work out a simple equation that can tell us how the rocket will perform. It's the sort of thing that a first-year aerospace engineering student might be asked to derive in an exam. The takeaway is this. Rockets are complex machines, but jokes about rocket science aside, ultimately what is possible with a rocket is governed by this simple equation. The amount by which a rocket can increase its velocity depends on the exhaust velocity of its engines, and what fraction of its starting mass is left over when the engines burn out. The implications of this aren't immediately obvious. So let's visualize it. Let's say we want to design a rocket that can take us to space. First, let's pick a rocket engine that will give us the best effective exhaust velocity. That will be a liquid-fueled hydrogen-oxygen engine, like the RS-25 or Space Shuttle main engine, which has been the gold standard in efficient rocket engines for decades. For the sake of this analysis, let's round up to an exhaust velocity of 4.5 kilometers per second. The rocket equation can be rearranged so that with our chosen engine we can work out the dry mass fraction of the rocket against the total delta V it would be capable of achieving. When you run the numbers, here's what the graph looks like. But simply, it shows us what we would expect to see. The faster you want to go, a bigger fraction of your rocket has to be fuel. If you imagine a rocket sat on the launch pad ready to take off, what the vertical scale on this graph is telling us is what percentage of that rocket isn't fuel. This is where we run into a problem. When we look at our desired delta V of 8.5 km per second, we discover that the mass fraction of our rocket comes out at 15%. This means that only 15% of the mass of our vehicle can be structure, fuel tanks, rocket engines, pumps, pipes, valves, actuators, avionics, electronics, and so on. If you want to get the rocket back, you might also want to include a heat shield, guidance fins, wings, landing gear, Let's also not forget that presumably you want to include a payload in the design somewhere. This is also before we have run into other problems, such as atmospheric pressure reducing the efficiency of our rocket, or having to have engines that are powerful enough to lift the starting weight of the rocket off the pad. Ideas for single stage to orbit rockets like the one we are considering here are notorious in the space industry. There have been numerous attempts made over the years to design and build such a rocket, usually by some combination of improving the engine performance and using new materials to make the vehicle lighter. None of these attempts have been successful, and the reason is always the same. When you start to get into engineering details, everything tends to weigh more than you were expecting, and the cost of the extra work needed to make it light enough is prohibitive. There is actually a long-running joke amongst single-stage to orbit rocket designers that the mass of the payload is generally a negative number once you have worked out the mass of everything else. There is a solution to this problem, of course, and it's one that's been used for every orbital rocket from Sputnik onward. It's called staging. Simply put, you use more than one rocket. You launch your orbital rocket from the top of another, even bigger rocket. If we go back to our rocket equation graph, and for the sake of argument, we split the delta V equally between two rockets, we can see that the mass fraction is a far more manageable 38% for each rocket. So there's a first stage to accelerate you half of the way, and then when that burns out, you cast off the empty fuel tanks and big engines and take off in the second stage to make it the rest of the way to orbit. Traditionally, both of these stages are expendable, which means that once they are used up, they end up being thrown away. It's expensive, but it works. It's also why there are only about 100 launches each year, compared with over 38 million commercial airliner flights in 2019. Which makes sense. After all, if every time you got in a jet and flew across the Atlantic you had to throw the aircraft away, it's hard to imagine there would be many flights. That is changing, however. 
Thanks to some absolutely superb engineering, SpaceX are now routinely retrieving and reflying their first stage boosters. This kind of reuse of hardware has the potential to make space flights a lot cheaper, but it doesn't do much to reduce the complexity of a multi-stage launch system, and at the end of the day, two rockets are always going to be more expensive than one. What if there was another solution though? For a single stage rocket, the problem is that the Earth is just a little bit too big. Therefore, the delta V needed to reach orbit from the surface of the Earth is just a little bit too high. So let's ask a different question. Let's turn our graph around, pick a mass fraction that we could comfortably achieve with existing engines and materials, say 21%, and see how close that gets us. What we find is that this rocket is good enough to get us more than 80% of the way there. That's a good start. So is there anything we can do to give our rocket a leg up so that it can reach orbit, even with the reduced total delta V? Well, yes there is. This rocket won't make it to orbit if we launch from ground level, but imagine for a moment that we could light the rocket whilst already flying at speed, high in the atmosphere. Say, Mach 5 at an altitude of 25 kilometers. It's only a small fraction of the way to orbit, but it makes all the difference because it closes the delta V gap. So how to get to Mach 5 without using a rocket? Use the atmosphere. Up until now I have talked about a rocket's fuel, but what I have really meant has been reaction mass. What characterises a rocket is that everything that comes out of the nozzle has to be carried on board, both the fuel and the oxidizer. in our case liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. A jet aircraft doesn't have this problem. It carries fuel, but the oxidizer and most of the reaction mass is air that is taken in by the air intakes. Even a very inefficient jet is therefore far more efficient than any rocket. This is where a space plane can have a huge advantage over a pure rocket. If the rocket engines can be made to capture and burn atmospheric air, the vehicle will be free from the rocket equation for that crucial first part of the flight. In fact, for a space plane there is a double saving, because for a winged aircraft the engine thrust does not need to exceed the vehicle's weight. The engines can therefore be much smaller and lighter. This is easier said than done, of course. There's a problem, which is that even really fast jet aircraft can't fly much faster than about Mach 2.7. Even the SR-71 spy plane, which used a very sophisticated combined turbojet and ramjet, could not exceed about Mach 3.3. The issue here is something called the stagnation temperature. When air enters a jet intake, it is compressed by the forward speed of the aircraft. And when it's compressed, it gets very hot. Too hot for the compressor and combustion chambers to handle. A solution to this problem was first demonstrated in the HOTOL space plane concept, proposed by British Aerospace and Rolls-Royce in the 1980s. This would have been a fully reusable single-stage to orbit space plane, capable of putting a 7-ton cargo into low Earth orbit. It featured the RB545 engine which could operate in an air-breathing mode, and which would cool the intake air by passing it through a heat exchanger before it entered a compressor. This is possible because liquid hydrogen is in fact a superb heat sink, many times better than water, so the cryogenic hydrogen fuel in the vehicle could serve a dual purpose, also acting as a coolant before it was burned in the engine. The hotel program was eventually cancelled, but the same basic concept lived on in the Skylon space plane and the Sabre engine. Using cryogenic hydrogen to pre-cool the air entering the engine would allow such a space plane to reach Mach 5.5 before needing to switch over to onboard oxygen. The engineering is complex and challenging, but such a space plane is achievable without the need for exotic materials or production techniques, and many of the key technologies have been demonstrated on ground test rigs. As of 2021, however, these space planes only exist on paper. SpaceX's Starship a fully reusable two-stage to orbit system that's in development can be seen in real hardware that's already being built and flown. Doesn't that prove that space planes have lost the race? Well, no. I still believe that the future belongs to space planes for two good reasons. The first reason is operational. A space plane that operates from a runway will always enjoy a huge operational advantage over a multi-stage rocket. I've already said that operating two vehicles is more expensive than operating one, but this is before the operational side of things is considered. Rockets like Starship and SpaceX's reusable boosters are not easy to move around and require an army of workers and special handling equipment to prepare them for flight. 
The multi-stage vehicle will land as separate sections, and to fly again the system has to be stacked or integrated. This is a careful and labour-intensive activity requiring specialist facilities. On the other hand, a single stage to orbit space plane only requires a runway, a hangar and a fueling facility, and probably a tow truck to move it around on the ground. The operation would much more closely resemble an airport air freight terminal than the extensive complex of cranes and high bays needed to tend to a fleet of starships. There is also something called cross-range. When bringing an orbiting spacecraft back to Earth, it is necessary to wait for the Earth to rotate so that the desired landing site is underneath the spacecraft's orbit. All re-entry vehicles have some ability to control their flight path during descent, but a winged vehicle has superb cross-range capability meaning that it can divert a considerable distance either side of its orbital track during re-entry. This degree of flexibility is extremely beneficial to a high volume commercial operation, because a launcher that is sat in orbit waiting for a suitable re-entry window is not making money. Better cross-range performance would translate directly into faster turnaround times. The second reason that the future belongs to space planes is safety. Rockets are dangerous. The Space Shuttle flew 135 times, and of those flights, two of them ended in disaster with the loss of the entire crew. Fly on a Space Shuttle and there's one chance in 60 or so that you will not survive the trip. Like the Space Shuttle, Starship doesn't have a launch escape system. There is no way for it to return to the launch site, so it is committed to reaching orbit from the moment that it leaves the pad. I think it's reasonable to expect that by reuse of hardware and large numbers of flights, the reliability of Starship could be improved to maybe 10 times better than the conventional rocket, but probably not much more than that. I think that this has to be viewed in context. Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, and it's believable that an early Mars colonist would be willing to board a Starship with 1 in 600 odds of not surviving the flight. In the context of trying to create a settlement on another planet, the risk experienced during launch and landing would probably be the least of their worries. If transportation between the surface of the Earth and space is ever to become routine, however, it is reasonable to assume that there will be a drive for much higher levels of safety than a system like Starship can achieve. For example, it's hard to imagine that the crew of an oil rig would accept the helicopter flight on and off the rig if the chances of being killed were one in a thousand. Likewise, the crew of future space, science and industrial platforms will expect a much safer trip to and from their place of work. In contrast to rockets, the safest means of transportation in the world today is commercial aviation, and the space plane is far closer to this model than a vertical launch rocket. A space plane is like an airliner, in that the ability to abort the flight and return the whole vehicle and payload to a runway exists throughout, though U-turns at Mach 5 are startlingly continent-sized. Space planes will probably never achieve the levels of safety of commercial aviation, but it's reasonable to expect safety improvements of at least a hundred to a thousand times better than conventional rockets. So if space planes are so much better than conventional rockets, why aren't we seeing companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, agile private enterprises unhindered by state and corporate bloat and risk aversion, throwing their efforts behind space planes? The simple answer is development costs. The program cost to develop the Skylon space plane was once estimated to be similar to that for the Airbus A380. When a fleet of just two or three Skylons could easily meet the entire planet's current launch needs, the numbers just don't add up. There is no way that the initial investors would make their money back. If you're the sort of person watching this video, you'll most likely believe, as I do, that it's obvious that human expansion into space will be the biggest commercial opportunity since Columbus discovered the New World. Unfortunately, the kind of people who are willing to invest large sums of money into speculative projects are much more grounded. They need more of an assurance that they will get a return on their investment than our romantic notions that the Star Trek future is inevitable. Rockets like Falcon 9, Starship and New Glenn cost a lot less to develop, not least because at heart they are simply an evolution of existing launch vehicles. Even then it has taken eccentric billionaires willing to throw their own money at what are essentially passion projects to make these happen. Individuals far more visionary than national space agencies have ever been. So my final word is this. The bigger the launch market becomes, the stronger the business case for commercial space planes becomes. The superb work being done by these new commercial rocket companies serves to grow that market. This brings forward the day when developing a space plane becomes a commercial no-brainer. When that day arrives, all it takes is an entrepreneur with vision and a can-do attitude, a Musk or a Bezos, to step forward and make it happen. The space planes are coming.
Until that day, well, Godspeed SpaceX and Blue Origin, and thank you for giving us some good news in what's otherwise been a very difficult year. Bring on the Star Trek future. This is Thumble Gadget, signing off.